Hello and welcome back to part two on my series about how to realistically draw human portraits using charcoal pencils. And in fact, this particular picture has two human portraits, so you're getting two for the price of one of which you were already paying nothing. Regardless, let's jump into the drawing. Today we're going to finish the, uh, the portrait that's on the left-hand side of this drawing. And when I say finish, I mean it'll be about 99% finished. We will eventually go back toward the end of this thing and start creating uh, more realistic shadows with the skin, with the hair. Uh, we will do touch-ups all at the end that will really make this pop out and look super realistic. But for right now, we will consider by the end of this video, uh, this particular section to be done. So the first thing I want to do is go in with my Q-tip and I'm going to pick a spot underneath the ear. I've really loaded up that Q-tip with uh, extra soft charcoal. And if you haven't been following along, all I do uh, with that is I scribble extra soft charcoal on a scrap piece of paper and then I rub the Q-tip in that to load up that Q-tip with charcoal dust. Then I usually scrub that along the, uh, the scrap paper in just a blank spot to take a little bit of the edge off, to take just a tiny bit of charcoal off of the Q-tip. Then I just go right into the drawing and I start scrubbing in things like shadows with the, the dirty Q-tip. Now I will try not to do a bunch of, of repeating here because I do have a nearly three hour long video for part one that explains how this whole process works. But I will uh, mention again that as you scrub with this Q-tip, the uh, the charcoal will pull off of the Q-tip and onto the paper and therefore the Q-tip will become cleaner the more you scrub. That means that your scrubbing will produce lighter and lighter results the more that you do it. So it's always better to start in a really dark area first that's going to have way heavier shadows and then scrub down to the lightest area because naturally the Q-tip is going to uh, produce lighter and lighter results on its own. Now one of the things that I need to do pretty much right off the bat is I'm kind of uh, defining the shadows around the bottom and the corner of the ear as well as the bottom of the jaw because we already have our basics laid and, and if you watched all of the last video, what is wrong with you? And two, you know that I've mentioned quite a bit that we're laying in a base and refining later. And we did a little bit of refinement um, throughout that video. But in this one, we're going to do quite a bit of refinement. This is where, this is the later that I was talking about in my first video. This is the one where we're going to jump in and we're really going to start fine tuning these shadows, fine tuning the highlights, darkening up areas that really need to be darkened. And as you can see here, I'm uh, using that Q-tip around on her face on these major shadows. And I'm not only darkening those up, but I'm kind of blending the edges of those shadows so that they fade into the highlights just a little bit better. That way the highlights themselves aren't just roped off and sharp. The highlights will do what they do in nature. In a low lighting situation like this, they will be more gradual. If they're too sharp, she will look too shiny. And the, lights, the lighting will look too harsh and her... The features on her face will look almost too sharp, like her bone structure is really sharp. And in reality, it's not. And the way to make that look natural is to make sure that those shadows gradually fade into the highlights. It's a gradient rather than you know a sharp, defined section of shadow. Now, as you can already see, I've filled in a lot of that highlighted area along her cheek, and now I'm going up into like the forehead area. And the highlights are still there, but they're definitely not as protruding as what they were. And by darkening up those areas, this is already starting to look more like a realistic person rather than a drawn person. And as we refine this more and more, especially along like the hair and things like that, it will look more and more realistic as well. But for right now, for what we're doing right now,
um, this is already starting to make this drawing pop out and become what the average person would consider to be photorealistic. Now you'll notice as I'm doing refinement throughout this, uh, this part of the video, I'm going to spend more and more time on her eyes and nose because those are focal points. In any portrait, the eyes, nose, and mouth are going to be your, your biggest focal points. Those have to be on the money. And so I'm really making sure that these areas have the right tone and the right contrast before we move on to other parts of the drawing. And I'll come back to this area several times by the time this entire series is done to refine it even more. Just more and more and more layers as we go along, uh, darkening and darkening more and darkening more. I mentioned it in the first video, and I'll mention it again. For me personally, if a drawing doesn't look realistic, one that I've created, uh, the solution almost 100% of the time is that I didn't draw it dark enough. Once I go back into that drawing and then I, I add some contrast and tone and more layers of darker charcoal, then all of a sudden it's like, it's like a magic trick. It suddenly becomes realistic. Now, I'm working with a blending stump around the bridge of her nose and into the shadows around her eyes because there are some defined shadows that kind of frame her face. And there are shadows that are subtle along, not really the bridge of her nose, but like uh, the side of her nose that are a little bit darker than the rest. And so what, by using a blending stump instead of a Q-tip here, I can control the area in which that shadow is located much, much easier. With a Q-tip, it's going to be it's going to cover more area and I can't really uh, control as easily where that charcoal rests on the paper but with a blending stump I know exactly where it is and I can uh, pinpoint it down to just a, a millimeter and, and shape it the way I want in a much sharper much more defined area Now, since the eye, we since we don't have a lot of room to work where this eye is, uh, especially since it's a uh, a photograph that's been taken from the side, it gives us less area to work, which in turn means we can put less detail into it. Since that's the case here, I want to make sure that the details we do put into it are exact, because they're few and far between. The ones that we have to work with. Um, they're important. They're more important than, than any of the details that we're going to put on the rest of this drawing because if we mess one up, instead of it being one of a hundred details in a, a normal eye that I draw, one that's shot from the front, it would be one of like 10 or 15 details in this particular drawing. Again, because it's such a small area to work with and we, we're not working with as many details as we normally do. So the fewer details that you have on an, an important area, and the more vital it becomes that you get them exactly right. Now you'll notice me going back in with a Tombow eraser from time to time to sharpen up the edges of the skin. We need to do that now before we start putting in the background because the background is going to be very fuzzy and out of focus. The foreground, which is going to be the portraits, the, the two heads in the shot, they're, they're very focused and very sharp. That visual contrast between focus and out of focus really needs to be on the money as well in order for this drawing to pull off the right effect. So I want to make sure that as we go, I don't have any fuzziness on the edges of the skin, the edges of the lips, the dress, and things like that. 
Now I'm going to take the Q-tip again, and this is somewhat dirty, but it's not loaded with a bunch of charcoal. It's, uh, it's got enough to make marks, but not so much that it's going to splotch if I put too much pressure on it. And I'm going to start using circular motions on the bottom of the jaw and work my way up the cheek to even out the shadow that's along the bottom of her jawline because that's not a real sharp shadow. It's sharper than the rest of her face, but it's not so sharp that it makes a defined line. So I need to, to make sure that's also at a gradient. While I've got that in my hand, I'll work my way across her face and darken little bits at a time. And then I notice by comparison that the ear looks too light. So I'm gonna jump over to the ear and make corrections on it and darken that up a little bit. And we're gonna do what I talk about in all these videos, which is We've laid the base, now we're starting to compare what we've drawn to what we have already gotten on the paper. Then we compare those two tones and those two contrasts and make adjustments so that they match. Now when I say making them match, I don't mean making them the same exact uh, tone and same exact contrast. What I mean is, if in the reference photo, this one has a, we'll, we'll assign values of tone and contrast. We'll say this one has a, a contrast value of two. That's a nonsensical thing, but I'm using it to, to make a comparison. So this ear has a contrast value of two and the cheek has a contrast value of four. It's darker than the ear. If we raise the cheek up to level five and make it a little bit darker, we need to also raise the ear up a level to, to level three so that in comparison to each other, that ratio stays the same. It's a weird way to look at it, but it's the only way I really know how to explain that if you make one section darker, you need to make the, uh, another section darker that directly compares to that so they go up in parallel to each other. Now in one of my earlier series where I drew, in fact my first series, when I drew a dog, one of the things that I mentioned was if you get to the point where you're losing motivation, one of the things that can keep you motivated is finishing another area because it feels like a, an achievement. It feels like you've crossed a finish line. And the more that paper you see filled up, the more your brain thinks, oh man, I'm, I'm almost done. I've got more completed, more papers covered up. So now instead of three quarters of the paper to fill, I only have two thirds of the paper to fill. So I'm going to start doing some work in this bottom area to fill out that, uh, that, that whole bottom left section. So I want to work on the curls, the dress, her neck, and the arm. The arm is obviously going to be the easiest part to do because it's just a gray mass and that's it. The dress is fairly simple to do because it's just black, but it's got two or three different tones of black in it. There's one that's super black to where there's almost no detail at all. Then there's another section that has a little bit of light bouncing off of it. So you can, you can differentiate between the solid black foreground and the slightly lit up background so the dress will have levels and it will go back into the distance instead of just being one big black block. If I did all in solid black, it would look like I just took a piece of black construction paper, cut it out and pasted it on there. It would be flat with no dimension to it. So the way I'm going to pull that off is I'm taking, I think this is extra soft charcoal. It almost has to be because I you couldn't get solid blacks with a hard charcoal. And I'm lightly drawing in the section that turns out to be a tiny bit lighter than the rest of it, I think. Uh, regardless, I'm gonna fill that in lightly. You can see actually where it's grainy looking and it looks like it's got little pinholes popping through the, uh, the charcoal. That's totally fine because once we get this laid in, we're gonna go back over that with a Q-tip and we're going to blend out all of those little pinholes and make sure that this black comes together to form a way smoother, way more solid mass. Now the other part that I'm being careful about here, you can see that straight line where the, uh, 
the neckline goes down and the, the dress folds over, I want to make sure that that's separated from the area I'm working on now. And the, I call it a collar, but it's not really, it's just the neckline of the dress. There's a bit of a reflection that happens on the right hand side of that. So I need to make sure that I'm not overlapping pencil strokes there because that needs to have that reflection in order for the viewer to recognize that as a collar that's catching a little bit of light. Now I'm going to go back up into what I just did and I'm, I'm not just adding another layer of black here. I'm using the pencil to color in between the pencil strokes. So let, let me try to clarify this and it's kind of weird to think about. If you color little sections at a time, or you, I say color, it's not coloring, <laughs> but if you drop in little sections at a time, let's like say half an inch tall, and you drop in another half inch tall section below that, your overlapping pencil marks are going to create a line between those two that are a little bit darker because you're doing charcoal on top of charcoal in that tiny little overlap section. So what I did there was I went to all the areas that didn't have that little overlapping section and added a tiny bit more charcoal so that it's smoother and didn't have those little overlapping lines in it. So now whenever I go back in with a Q-tip and I start blending all this together, it will be more of a solid mass and less of uh, what appears to be little blocks of charcoal in squares and rectangles that go all the way down. Anybody that's worked in charcoal and graphite before and has had to fill in a large area with a pencil knows exactly what I'm talking about with those little overlapping square type lines. That's how I get rid of them. Go back in, leave the, the little overlapping lines alone and fill in some more black and the areas that don't overlap so that they match. Now that we have that laid in with a Q-tip or blended in with a Q-tip, we need to go back in with a blending stump and we're going to sharpen up those edges because we couldn't get the Q-tip close to the edge because remember, the Q-tip is all fuzzy and fluffy and so it, it makes a, a really fuzzy, fluffy edge to whatever we're blending in. We're using the blending stump like a pencil so that we can get into those sharp edges and blend the black together in the areas that the Q-tip couldn't get to, that we didn't allow the Q-tip to get to. Now you can see once I've got this black laid in, compare that to the face that we already have done. And notice how light that makes that face look. That's one of the things that, that I harp on a lot is compare what you're drawing to what you've already drawn. And so that comparison between those two tones, between those two contrasts, it's pretty dramatic. It makes the face, no matter how well the face looked before, and no matter how good we thought it looked before, by comparing that to the black we just laid in, it makes the whole thing look flatter and lighter. So I know for a fact, just by looking at that, we're going to have to go in and fix that a little bit later and add some more black to not just the, uh, the face, but also the hair. If you ever want to know how light your drawing actually is because I guarantee for most people it's way lighter than you think. There are two things you can do. One is lay in one of your super black areas and then compare it like we're, we were just talking about. The other thing is uh, grab your phone, take a picture of your the drawing that you're working on and bring it up digitally and lay it side by side with your reference photo. So if your reference photo is digital um, just open up the digital reference photo and then hold your phone side by side. I'd actually recommend not doing it on your phone uh, or uh, you can do it on your phone, just do it on the same platform. So in other words, if you're doing a laptop, uh, 
pull up a picture of what you're working on on the same laptop that has the reference photo. If you're working off of your phone, uh, take a picture of your drawing and then swipe back and forth between the reference photo and your drawing. The reason is because different human eyes are going to view the drawing in different ways. It's the same thing with a laptop, a PC, a phone. Your phone is going to display a photograph likely differently than your PC is. So having the reference photo and the photo of what you're working on on the same platform will give you uh, the same comparative view with the same set of eyes, if that makes sense. So yeah, I, you, if you put those side by side, like on your PC and you go back and forth between the two, you're gonna notice right away how light your drawing is compared to how dark the reference photo is. Now that said, we don't always want to match the darkness of your drawing to the darkness of the reference photo. If you're going for absolute realism, that's totally fine. We are not going for absolute realism here. We're not wanting a, a carbon copy of the original photograph. What we're wanting is, comparatively, those tones and contrasts need to, to match each other. But I want this drawing to be a little bit lighter than the original photograph because I want it to look at least a little bit drawn. I want it to have that pencil lead look, that charcoal look to it. If we wanted to, after we're completely done with this drawing, we could spend the next 50 hours just adding in darkness in the right areas and we could match this up perfectly to the original photograph and make it just darn near hyper realistic. But that's not what I want here. I want it to have at least some character. I want people to look at it and know that, you know, upon further inspection that it's a drawing. And I want people to see the skill and the pencil work that we put into it. If we make a completely carbon copy, exact replica of the original photograph, um, it's, to me, it comes off like we're just a human printer. And that's not what I'm going for. It's impressive to see people do that. I respect the skill that it takes, and I really like looking at work like that. But personally, I don't want to spend that much time on something that's going to send out that message and is going to make me feel in that way. I like the idea of having rough drawn in backgrounds. I like to see the pencil work in it, but I also like when a the average non-artist person first sees a drawing like this, I love their reaction when they don't know that it's a drawing just yet. And when they realize that it's a drawing, that surprise and that shock on their face is one of the most flattering things that makes me feel so good when it happens. But then, like, when they notice that it's a drawing and they really start studying how I did it, and looking really close at it, I, that's what I really like. That's why I don't want this to have a completely carbon copy feel to it. Now, with all that rambling aside, I'm doing the same technique with the left side of the dress as I did with the right side of the dress. The slight difference here is that I have a little bit of negative space I have to worry about because there's one curl that swipes and swoops across that section of the dress. In fact, there's actually a couple curls that do it. So I need to be careful in this area to not overlap too much with those curls. I also have part of her right arm on our bottom left hand side that I need to account for. And I have all these curls that go from the dress into her neck. So I have a, a few extra shadows to worry about too. And I need to make sure that shadows and uh, dress material don't look like the same thing. Now what I talked about earlier with the varying shades of black on this dress, I was actually wrong in the opposite direction. The side that faces us, that's closest to us, is a tiny bit lighter than the black that's on the furthest point on, on the right. So what I've done is I've made it black, but I've made it slightly less black than the far right. Now by doing that, it gives you an idea that the light is coming from, you know, way in front of them in this picture. And it makes the, the dress have its own gradient from a very, very dark gray 
uh, slowly and subtly fading into a, a, a richer black. Now there's a section of this dress that is way lighter than the rest of it. And there's also an added uh, kind of nuisance here. Uh, I'm calling it a nuisance. It's not. It's going to add some fantastic detail. Uh, but she's wearing a very thin necklace. And the necklace, I, I love it because it's almost too big for her childlike size. And so it goes over her neck, under her hair, and then it goes way down over her dress. So you see one side of the, the uh, necklace chain that faces us, and then a tiny little bit of it that goes up on the right where the dress folds over. And so what I'm doing is I'm laying in the black down here up to her neckline, and I'm making sure that I don't overlap where the necklace goes across because I need that to be a negative space there. I could lay in the black and then erase that in with a Tombow eraser. But the problem is this dress is dark enough that if I tried to erase in the whiteness and the reflections from the necklace, it's actually more difficult because I'm going through many, many thick layers of charcoal to bring back out the whiteness. They could damage the paper and more likely what's going to happen is the eraser marks where I erase in the little necklace uh, glints of light and highlights is going to be dirtier than if I just leave negative space to begin with. So time-wise, ease-wise, and technique-wise, I'm using negative space to put in the very first uh, pieces of this necklace, then I'll refine the necklace later. Now we have a few curls of hair that go down over her shoulder and right now they look kind of dirty and uh, too fluffy along the edges. That's another thing we're going to refine pretty shortly. Uh, but for right now I've just kind of filled in black around them. And you can see when I'm doing this necklace too by the way, I am initially laying in black in kind of like these little lumpy uh, kind of lowercase m patterns like upside down u's and I'm doing that because the the chain is kind of and it's done in the same way it's kind of lumpy and and has it looks like little o's that go down uh, her chest and so I'm doing the same thing with this pencil in order to create the negative space in the right shape because remember in the first video we talk about shape a lot. That's the number one thing we worry about first. And then we go into detail and refinement. So I've created the texture and shape by making little upside down U's or backward C's to create that chain. I finish filling out the dress with my, uh, with my pencil. And I may have actually been uh, using hard charcoal there. It's hard for me to see on this video, uh, but regardless, the the result is that I'm not putting much black in that area because I think it's an area that we have to fill in with our q-tip and then darken up a little bit later because that gradient exists so now with the pencil still in hand and yes this is hard charcoal because I would never use um, extra soft charcoal in an area that's as sensitive as blonde hair right off the bat. But I'm going to fill in 
some of the areas that need to be a little bit sharpened up where those curls come down and that separates them from the dress itself. So now you can see they kind of pop out a little bit but watch whenever I start to blend this in here in just a bit uh, they'll really start to pop out once that background black becomes more solid. And now I've gone into extra soft charcoal and now I'm really adding in quite a bit of the uh, thicker more powerful punchy black. Now those curls are starting to pop out a little more and we're, we can see now that as I lay in this darker black uh, that this dress is able to be seen through the little spaces between the clumps of hair. Now, even though this is extra soft charcoal and it, it creates way richer blacks, I'm starting on this section of the dress using light. And you can see here, I want to twist this pencil around. See how this has got a flat, like 45 degree angle on the end? I'm using that flat edge of the pencil to lay in a fat, soft layer of extra soft charcoal very lightly. And the reason is because hard charcoal doesn't just draw um, lighter lines. It also has a weird hue to it that's almost in like the brown or red spectrum. It's very, very subtle. The very, very black extra soft charcoal is kind of a cooler black that's more along the like blue spectrum. And so I'm using that soft charcoal to create a gradient down toward the bottom of the dress and to soften up that hue just a little bit. That's something almost no one is going to notice except for the artist, is the hues that happen within the charcoal. But it's enough that I notice and I want it toned down. So I'm using that extra soft charcoal to create the gradient to make it a little blacker toward the bottom than what I could get with hard charcoal. And then when I blend that all together, the hard and extra soft charcoal will mix together at, within that gradient and it will make a smoother texture for that dress. Now same thing here, I'm going to blend it in where it's peeking through the hairs. And now with this section, I don't really need to use a, a blending stump here to sharpen that up. And the reason is because a lot of like that background darkness is going to pop through on the outer edges of those clumps of hairs because the hairs are slightly transparent themselves. So it's okay for that, that background black to be faded slightly into those hairs. If we want to sharpen those up later, we absolutely can with a blending stump but it's totally fine to allow that to bleed into the hair just a tiny bit because it's going to do that naturally. As you can see with that, uh, with that little swoop that's like a elongated U that goes over her shoulder, that one I've allowed to go way into the hair and it looks like just a big dirty splotchy line. That's because I can go back over that a little bit later with a Tombow eraser and define that out quite a bit more and mold that into what I need it to be. But for the time, I'm, I left it as negative space because it's a little bit easier to operate that way. But then we can refine that with a Tombow eraser and Q-tips and whatnot here in the near future. So anyway, back to the dress itself. I'm just adding another layer of dark charcoal on top of that and smoothing that out way better than what it was. Because again, it needs to be, it needs to come across to the viewer as black, but we know as artists that it's actually a, a dark gray because that's where the light is hitting it. So I'm going back into the bottom parts of that with a, a very loaded Q-tip and adding in more and more layers of black and it gets blacker the further down it goes on the drawing. 
So you'll see me really load it up and lay in another layer of black on the bottom and kind of work that toward the top so it, it remains as a gradient that goes from dark to light from the bottom up. Now I'm going to reload that Q-tip again, and I'm going to go back into the black that I've already laid on the left-hand side of the dress, and we're going to take out even more pencil marks. The big thing here is we want it to be smooth so that it doesn't look so rough that it, it makes the face look awkward. We don't need it to be so smooth that it looks like a printed photograph, but we do need it smooth enough to where it's, it's not going to make the rest of the drawing look awkward and weird. Now we're going to do what I repeat a lot, which is look at what we've already drawn, compare it to what we have just drawn, and refine those old areas to match that, that new contrast, the new tone. And by looking at the new black that we just laid down on the dress, it made the eyes look super light. Even though we've refined that at least twice, if not three times already, it still wasn't enough in comparison to the new black that we just laid down. So we're going to darken up the eyes quite a bit. And now you can see even before I go into further refinement, just adding that little bit of darkness along the eyes and just a tiny little touch along the lips it matches a little better and, and looks a little more realistic already. We will eventually get to the point to where this entire thing has, um, it goes way more hand in hand with each other, it's more cohesive. But for right now, just a little bit of a touch up was enough to, to make it look a tiny bit more realistic. So if you notice an area that needs fixing while you're doing a drawing like this, it's totally fine to stop what you're doing, go fix that area, but do it quickly, then get back to what you were doing earlier. Because if you get too locked in to like, if I decided I wanted to really put a lot of detail on that eye, I could have been stuck on that eye for the next hour. And that's not what I want to do. I want to complete what I set out to do, which is get that dress in the lower left-hand corner of this drawing finished. So right now we're doing the inside part of the collar or the neckline, and that part is super black because not only is it black material, but it's also embedded in the, some of the heaviest shadows in the entire drawing. So we're laying in a ton of like jet black with the, uh, the, the extra soft charcoal. And then I'm gonna take a very sharp blending stump. In fact, I'm using one that is way harder than the rest of the blending stumps. I'll go into what that means later or in a later video. And I'm using that almost like a pencil because I want the edges of this shadow and the edges of this dress to be ultra sharp. And you can see what I mean here. As I'm sharpening up those edges, compare it to the top of the neckline of the, the softer parts of that black, that almost looks fuzzy on the very top of the neckline. But on this shadow that's on the far right, that is a very sharp edge. And now to soften up that little highlight that's on the far right hand side of this neckline, I use the, the dirty blending stump and just very lightly go over that just to take the white edge off of it. Now be a little bit careful with the edges of, of things like this that butt up against skin. If you get that edge incorrect, if you get the shape of that edge incorrect or the angle, it will change the uh, shape and the direction of the skin that's butted up against it. So if we went too far to the left by a quarter of an inch, 
then it's going to, to make the neck look like it dips in a quarter of an inch. So that particular part of it, even though it's not as detailed as the rest of the drawing, needs to, to be exactly correct in its shape so that we don't ruin the shape of the actual skin. So now that I have that laid in, I'm going to go back up into the neck because that's one of the last areas that is just pure white paper in this section of the drawing. And I want to make sure that I get that filled in so that it, I can feel that accomplishment and keep myself motivated to continue this drawing and to finish it. So I'm laying in a bunch of the shadows that appear and in this section of the head and this section of the neck, the shadows here are quite a bit darker than the rest of the face. I already know that it's going to be dark like that, so I'm not giving myself a mental landmark or a visual landmark uh, like I normally would. I'm just laying in a bunch of the soft grays now uh, just to get it finished. And then later I'm going to go back in and darken those up quite a bit more so that they stand out and show depth. The other thing this forces me to do is once I have this, this soft grays added in to this part of the neck and I get those shadows started to lay in, see how it makes the curls almost disappear because they kind of blend into that background? It forces me to go into those curls and finish them. Otherwise if I don't, if I leave those until later, it's very likely that I'm going to forget what's a curl and what's a shadow and then I'm going to have a little bit of trouble kind of uh, mentally sorting what's what. So I'm going to lay this in now and then I'm going to make sure that by the end of this video I go into those curls and I give those definition and I finish them. I love this part of the drawing because once I start on this, these curls, it almost becomes like a magic trick. I mean, they look really rough and thrown in. They look kind of neat. You know, you could leave them like that if you wanted it to look super artsy. But once I start adding in the details to these curls, it's, it's so, it makes me giddy because they go from kind of a cool looking rough thrown in object to like reality and it happens super fast as I'm adding in the uh, the details it's like it looks out of focus and blurred and then all of a sudden BAM curls now as I'm doing this part here I'm adding in the shadows of the neck and and there are several different variations of gray that happen in this area. Some that are caused by the dip in her, around her throat, uh, the very bottom base of the neck. There's another dip that happens, you know, to the left of that. And it also makes me notice that the jawline is a tiny bit off shadow wise. So I've made a mental note of that while I'm adding in this gray, but I'm not going up to fix it just yet because I know that once I've thought of that and I've noticed it, it's going to stick out in my mind forever. Just part of that is probably OCD. But I make a mental note that whenever I'm darkening up this image, especially during final touches, that I fix that shadow along her jawline. Because remember, right now, I'm not just throwing in uh, shadows and just looking at the area that I'm filling in. I'm looking at the area I'm filling in and also my eyes are darting up to the rest of the drawing and comparing, constantly comparing what I'm doing with what I've done. Remember what you're drawing now whenever you're doing these comparisons doesn't just influence what you're drawing. It also influences what you've already done. So if you correct this area of the neck or I correct that area in the jawline, 
and it makes another thing look out of proportion, it means I also have to fix that other thing that looks out of proportion. Now we're going to go back into the uh, top of the neckline and start adding in some uh, definition along the necklace, along the top of the, the neckline, because it's not a fuzzy dress. It's not made with like fuzzy material. It's more like, um, I don't even remember the material, silk or satin or whatever. But regardless, the point is that the neckline itself ends in more of a sharp edge than it does like a fuzzy gradient. And now that we're here and we have this, uh, this blending stump in our hand, this is a really good time to start sharpening up the, the edges of these curls, of these stray clumps of hair. This is going to make these start to pop out and look more realistic because we're taking the fuzzy edge off of those. As you can see, the one that I just worked on it's a little fuzzy and clumpy in the middle. That's fine. I'm more worried about the edges right now than I am the inside. The inside is one of the easiest parts to, to fix and refine. And now we'll do the same thing with the outside of the dress as well. So I've just gone back in with the Q-tip and I'm going to soften up those hairs a little bit, the stray hairs and the stray curls, with a little bit of soft gray. Because if we left those pure white, it would be too reflective. And instead of her hair looking blonde or sandy blonde, it would look bleach white. And we, we don't want that. We want it to look uh, a little bit sandier. So we take a little bit of the reflection off with the Q-tip. then where you can go back up into the, the regular mass of hair that's especially around the little balled up ponytail. And we're gonna start adding in some detail with, uh, I believe it's hard charcoal. Yeah, it's hard charcoal here. We're gonna start adding in some details where we start defining some of the shadows and adding in pinstripe shadows um, that don't represent single hairs they represent clumps of hairs. I can't stress that enough. If you start thinking that you're drawing in single hairs, you're going to add too many and it's going to look like you just made a whole bunch of swipes with a pencil on it. That's why it looks unnatural. Start thinking in terms of clumps of hairs casting thin shadows and you'll be more prone to adding in just a a little sparser version of those. You won't add quite as many of them and it will look, believe me, it looks way more natural when you do it that way. Now around this area I have to be careful because I have a curl that cuts across horizontally this area. The hairs behind it go vertically and so I have to make sure that the 
pinstripe type shadows that I'm adding here stop at that horizontal cutoff and then I continue them down below. Um, so I've got to be careful where those start and stop so that I don't ruin one of those curls, one of those sections of hair. It's the same thing when I go into this bald up ponytail over here. Those are going almost vertical, but then they kind of uh, loop around or swoop around into an almost horizontal version because they curl. It looks like a like an upside down U or a backward C uh, elongated. And so I need to make sure that that swooping motion stays within that ball of hair and doesn't go outside of it and break that plane. Because if I go too far outside of this, then it tries to blend itself in with the rest of the hair. And that's not what this is. It's its own entity. It's its own shape. So we have to kind of stay inside the lines here uh, to make sure that it visually represents that ball and doesn't accidentally blend into the rest of the hair because it can really trick the viewer's eyes if you go outside of that line too far or really at all. Now you'll notice that the strokes that I'm making only go up I, I would say probably half an inch and then I, I the strokes that I make as I get toward the middle are much lighter and then just completely disappear. By doing that, I create the illusion that there is a reflection right at the apex of that curve. So the shadows that we're making in those hairs along that little ball, they, they fade into nothing because the reflective areas don't show those shadows as much, if not at all. Now once I start refining these darker shadows up toward the top, that's where all the hair meets at kind of a single point, where the rubber band or the ponytail holder or whatever is there is holding all that hair in place at a single point. So I'm making sure that the shadows in that area are way darker. Then I can go back down to the little balled up ponytail part below it, and I can start doing what we talked about earlier in reverse. I start laying in those thicker, darker shadows and make those fade as they go down toward the middle instead of up toward the middle. And as you can see, it's already looking way more reflective than what it did because I'm adding those darker line definitions. Now we're gonna start to separate that bald up ponytail from the rest of the curls by adding a, a fairly defined line along the edge of it and there's a curl that kind of swoops down in front of it just down to the bottom right so we want to make sure that those two things are separated that they are their own things they don't blend into each other you can do one of two things here you can do what i'm doing which is taking a blending stump and blending each of those little pencil marks uh, one at a time in order to get rid of the the pencil the sharp pencil marks or you can do the same thing with a q-tip it's just that if you do if you blend this with a q-tip you're going to darken the entire area around each of these hairs and it's going to make it look softer so that if you find that the hair that you're drawing looks too sharp and has too many lines uh, that are sticking out and you've gone a little bit too dark on them using a q-tip can soften up entire areas i'm happy with the way my individual lines look here so i'm just going back over it with a blending stump and basically just uh, taking out the pencil stroke marks and the little and the sharpness from each of those individual lines that way one of the things i can do while i'm doing it is pull beyond the line that i drew so if i drew a line that was a half inch long I'll blend over that half inch and then pull an additional quarter inch to a half inch beyond it. And so the line that I drew will be dark and then the line that I blended beyond that will fade into more of a gradient and go from black to lighter to lighter and then disappear.
And that's the way most hair shadows do in actual real life. That's one of the things that makes this look realistic is not just the little lines we put that represent shadows, but the varying shades and the varying gradients that happen within those shadows. Now that those are laid in, I can go back in with uh, hard charcoal and I can start doing the same thing with the curls. And now we're going to start to define those curls much, much more than what they were before. We're going into like this area that I'm working on right now. We're going to see some major refinement here. This is not going to be one of these areas where we say we'll lay it in now and then refine it later because we already have the basics laid in. This is the refinement that happens later. Once these are in, there's not much more that we're going to do to this section of the drawing. Now the biggest thing to keep in mind while I'm doing this stuff down here is there are a bunch of different directions that happen. So you'll get a piece of hair that, that swoops down at an angle that's more vertical than horizontal. But then when it curls back toward us, toward the camera, it changes direction and goes totally horizontal. But it's the same piece of hair. It's just curling out toward us. So we need to make sure that even though we have to differentiate those two little uh, lines, those two little bunches of hair, that they remain flowing together. Otherwise, it's gonna look like we took, we drew a line here, then we drew another line there. It needs to flow. So we need to make sure that the directions that we put whenever we're doing the shading and the pencil lines, those need to be absolutely on the money whenever we're laying those in. When we're looking at those curls, they need to flow. We can almost feel like it's a, like it's a roller coaster track. Now, one of the things you'll see happening here as I try, as I define these curls that are down along the dress, is you'll see me turn the pencil a lot in my hand. I'll draw a few lines and then you'll see me very quickly turn it like a quarter to a half turn. The reason that I'm doing that is I need a very sharp edge for some of this, but not for others. If I'm doing the outline of an edge, I need the point to be very sharp. As I scrub in some of that gray, the, the point becomes less sharp. It becomes duller just because I'm taking charcoal off of it. But as one side of the pencil becomes dull, the other part sharpens because you're putting an edge on one side of that pencil. So I draw just a little bit, give it a quarter turn, draw a little bit more, another quarter turn just to keep that sharp. One of the dangers of doing this is that the sharper your pencil, there's, there's more of a danger of you putting a line that's too dark because there's less surface area on a sharp point than there is on a rounded dollar point. So because of that, whenever I'm doing these lines, I need to make sure I'm using a light stroke so that I'm not going too hard with it. Not only would going too hard uh, put too dark of a line, it would also completely destroy the teeth of the paper and that line that I drew would look shiny. 
Now on this curl that happens on the very bottom middle part of her dress, I need to have that a tiny bit fuzzy, but I'm still going to add an edge to that. And the way I do that is just like the rest of this, I, I add the edges with a pencil, but I also have to scrub in some gray into the dress itself because there's a fuzzy edge that surrounds that hair that's way lighter than the dress itself. So I need to match the tone of the dress and butt that right up against that curl. So I, I scrub in gray starting from the curl itself and then go out into the dress until that matches. Then I can smooth all that out with a blending stump. Then while the blending stump is in my hand, I can go to these other curls and start laying in a, a darker tone here so that it looks a little less reflective than what it already does. I need to to scrub out some of that whiteness. Now I want to add a little bit of reflection on that middle curl and the way I can do that is real simple. I start at the bottom of the hair and I scrub a slightly darker section and then I get lighter as I go toward that middle. So you create a gradient that starts dark at the bottom and gets lighter toward the middle. That lighter part when you have a gradient that goes up versus the other gradient that happens at the top of that curl and goes from dark to light from top to bottom, the lighter area in the middle will suddenly appear like it's reflecting light. One of the things that I like to do in my drawings is the further you go away from the face, the less detail I put into it. Now normally if I was doing that with this one, I would have less detail on the hair and as we went to the edge of the paper it would, be, it would get less and less and less until it was real fuzzy. I don't want to go that extreme in this drawing. But I do want the bottom left hand part where the dress goes into the arm, I want that to be a little bit fuzzy. I want a couple of these curls that are down on the far bottom left hand side to kind of uh, be a little less fuzzy than that. So I'm going to start reducing the amount of detail just slightly as we go down into the left. <laughs> 
that's just a personal artistic choice that I make. It's kind of my own signature. I know a lot of other artists do it, um, but that's the thing I've chosen to do in my drawings to make all of my styles cohesive with each other. Remember the gradient that we did that caused the reflections and those bottom middle curls that happen over the dress? We need to kind of replicate that with each of the other curls that happen in the hair because they're each going to have their own apex, their own closest point to us, and therefore they need to have their own reflections so that they stand out against the background. Those don't all need to be dramatic reflections because remember there's going to be curls that happen over the tops of other curls. Those are going to cast their own shadows on the ones below it. So they don't all have to be done in exactly the same way, but we need to keep the general idea that each of those curls and the hair overall have a reflection that it is lighter in the middle than it is on the tops and bottom because that's where the points of light are happening. They're happening in the middle of that apex that's closest to us as a viewer. So if you look at her hairdo that happens in the middle of her head on that left hand side, there's a subtle strip of light that happens across the very middle. And that, that's the overall hair being darker on top, darker on bottom, then getting light as you go toward the middle so that the hair overall has its own reflection. Then you go into more detail with the curls and each of the curls echoes that same thing. Now I mentioned in the first video that there are shadows that happen around the, the ear that are hard to tell what's hair and what's a shadow because they all carry basically the same tone. We're going to start adding a few stray hairs and a few curls in that area so that the viewer isn't really confused about what's a shadow and what's hair. We're just going to add a few, not many. And then we're going to go down into the curls that happen along her neck and we're going to start defining those out as well so that we can just straight up finish this this area that's in the bottom left of the the drawing everything we're doing here is actual refinement The biggest pain with this part and the hardest part of, of doing it is making sure that we keep track of what curls go in what direction, what curls are on top versus what are on bottom, uh, which direction specific curls are going. So the whole idea, the, the whole uh, difficult part of this section is making sure that we keep track of every individual strip of curls.
Otherwise, what happens is we can throw in something that doesn't quite fit and we'll have a curl that hangs out in the middle of nowhere. And if you really do some close inspection on it, you're going to find that it's not connected to the rest of the hair. It's just this floating magic curl. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want any floating magic curls here. We want them all to connect with the rest of the hair and all flow together. We just need to be careful about knowing what goes where so that they can all remain their individual strips of hair. I mentioned in the last video that these uh, strips that I'm working on now, this large one that goes right behind the ear, and there's one just to the right of it, they look too outlined, and I had done that on purpose so that I gave myself a very dramatic landmark uh, to remind myself where I'm at in the drawing. This is where we're going back and fixing those outlines so that they look more natural, so that they don't look like a comic book outline, they look like strips of hair. The way I'm doing that is not only adding shadow to the middle of that hair, I'm also kind of fixing some of the shadows on the outside of that hair where you get that upside down W or that crow's foot shadow where all the hair meets together. Blending the outline of that section into that shadow will make it the, the strip of hair flow into the rest of the hair rather than looking like I just took a big sharp dark uh, piece of charcoal and outlined it. And we're using that same technique here where this particular strip of hair is darker on the top and darker on the bottom and then goes to a much lighter section in the middle. That's what makes it not just look reflective, it's what actually makes it look blonde. You'll see that whenever we get to the dark hair on the right, on the, the next face that we do, we're going to use a different technique to do that hair. And it is very, very dark, almost jet black in most of the hair. And so comparing the hair on the left to the hair that we will eventually do on the right will make this definitely pop out as blonde, even if it doesn't look totally blonde right now which I think it does, but I can see where other people may look at it and just assume that it's dark brown. Maybe I drew it too light or whatever. But the point of that rambling bit that I just threw in there is that just like whenever we compare the parts we've drawn to the parts we're drawing, we're also going to compare the things that are in this face to the other face that we're drawing. So we're going to compare it you know, at, at the two faces together and by seeing this extremely dark hair on the right, it will make the hair on the left look lighter. And the, the opposite's true. If you look on this hair on the left and it looks light to you, whenever your eyes pop over to the face on the right and see that hair, it will, by comparison, immediately set your brain off and say, that's definitely black, like jet black. Now as I add in a few of these stray hairs, these little strips of hairs that are much smaller and into a point, I didn't use a pencil for most of that. I used a blending stump uh, to fan those out a bit because those are not sharp single hairs. They're a small collection of hairs. So using a blending stump when I do those little extra stray ones that are below her ears, it fans out the line a little bit and makes it a little fuzzier and blurrier. And that is kind of a little trick to make clumps of hair rather than individual ones. Using a pencil there with no blending stump would have made it look so sharp um, that it would look awkward and unnatural.
Now that we're at the bottom of these curls, we need to be a lot uh, more careful with the pencil itself. We're going to, we need to add the lines in with the pencil, but it needs to be a super light touch because now the hair is, it's starting to end. You're getting less and less hairs in the, the overall clump. And since they're a light color and they're more transparent than the rest of the hair, you can see through them a little bit better and they're going to get naturally lighter as there's, you know, they get less and less in uh, amounts. So those end up looking a little bit more transparent than the rest of the hair. So I'm just very, very lightly gonna add those in with a pencil. Then we can go back over those with a blending stump in just a bit and take out any of those pencil marks. That will also allow the pencil to blend just a tiny bit darker than what I'm using with the pencil. So we draw those in a little bit lighter uh, in anticipation of the blending stump darkening those up just a tiny bit. Now I know some of you may be thinking that this looks really tedious, but I assure you that you're correct. It is extremely tedious. But if people could just whip something out like this in five minutes, everybody would have this skill set and it wouldn't be impressive. Part of the draw to something like this is the fact that people can look at it and know by looking how much just tedious, incredible work went into it. The amount of time and effort that you put into these drawings, people can really see that. And they appreciate that in a drawing that's based on realism.
as I'm doing this kind of uh, step back and look away from what I'm currently doing and kind of take a look at what I've already done and notice how much more realistic that looks now than what it was in that first video specifically around the area where all that hair meets and the little balled up ponytail part and the little crow's foot shadow that happens just behind her ear that's all coming together and looking way more realistic because I've done a lot darker shadows where they need to be darker. One of the reasons that I point that out is because here in just a little while, especially toward the end of this video series when I start doing touch-ups, I'm going to add some pretty dramatic uh, darkening to this hair in those same areas along the top, along the bottom, and I think I even pull it down toward the middle a little bit to sharpen up and give a, a lot more contrast to that area and it becomes even more realistic looking then than what it does now but even now before like final touch type of refinement it's starting to look like actual hair One of the reasons that I think it's important to learn these types of techniques is because even though it may appear tedious and appear like a lot of work that I put into this so far, keep in mind that everything you're seeing here was done in about three to three and a half hours. Once you learn these techniques and you, you learn to apply them uh, and you know where to go and know what to do right off the top of your head, and you, especially when you get really used to comparing and fixing rapidly, you can do an entire port portrait like this in an afternoon. Now I'm going to go back with the Tombow eraser and start throwing in some highlights. I'm not only throwing in some highlights in the little strips of hair, but I'm also kind of coming off of each one of those uh, hair strips and throwing in little stray hairs that come off of those. Because there's always, there's never just a straight strip of hair and it just stops. There's all these little ends of hairs that kind of curl off of those. In the video, it's not going to come across as much as it does in real life. In real life, whenever you look at this drawing, you'll notice a ton of these little stray hairs that that come off not only where the dress is but in the rest of her hair as well there's little white marks uh, here and there where stray hairs kind of pop out and those are so easy to make you just take the tombow eraser and just lightly make little swoop marks here and there hopefully at some point you know, in the future, I'm able to get a better camera to where I can record these in 4K and you can zoom right in and actually see these, uh, these fine details that I'm putting in like this.
now that I've got the hair the way I want it, I'm going to start working on this necklace. And the funny thing to me is that I thought this necklace was going to take me a couple of hours to do because it's so fine and it's such a small pinpoint type detail. But really all I had to do was just make little circular dots with a pencil. <laughs> then after that I just went back in with a Tombow eraser and made little circular dots on top of those so that I create a point of shadow, a point of top end reflection, and then I just drop a basic small shadow underneath it and it's done. I didn't have to put hardly any detail at all because we're at a distance from that necklace to where it's just a chain and nothing more. It's not intricate. Now once I have the the little dots in place to represent the chain, I just go back with a blending stump. I don't need to put any extra charcoal or anything on it. And I'm just going to lightly scrub in a small shadow where that chain touches her neck. Now when I get into the dress, I'm not really worried about the shadow. I'm just kind of uh, dirtying up the chain itself in order to make it look a little less reflective. One of the other things I did with that blending stump was I'm not just laying in a shadow, I'm kind of scrubbing up into the chain itself. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because we put in a dark uh, little point, little polka dot, to represent the darkest part of the shadows. Then I use the blending stump to put in mid-tone shadows, and that gives me a background enough to where I can do these little pinpoint highlights with a Tombow eraser and they'll stand out. So I gave myself a base to work upon to where now it's not just little dots that create the necklace. There will be dark shadows, mid-tone shadows, and points of bright white reflection. So there's three different levels to what I did to this necklace. And the funny thing to me is it only took, I don't know, like a minute, two minutes to create the entire thing front to finish. I mean, look at these reflections that happen over the top of the dress here as I use that Tombow eraser to add those in. They just stick out like a sore thumb and it just looks cool to me. Just like that, there's a necklace. It took no, no crazy techniques to pull off. And now to kind of represent it going around her, the side of her dress and into like over her other shoulder, I just put a few dots that got a little lighter along that edge of the dress and it just looks like it goes down below the camera and back up on the other side of her dress and disappears out of sight. So while I'm doing this, I'll uh, kind of tell you about, I, I do shows every once in a while. They're nothing you'll be able to go to because they happen in small towns in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. <laughs> but one of the, the questions that's asked most frequently to me at those shows is, when did I learn how to draw? And was I classically trained? Or I mentioned in the last video, I'm not trained. I, I had high school art classes, which 
they were some of them were done as electives, but at the time when I was in high school, you were required to have at least one art class. So I had art classes with a teacher who was not proficient at drawing. The teacher was more into like carving wooden ducks and making model airplanes. And that sounds like a joke. I, I swear that's the absolute truth. He didn't know how to draw. He gave me a few pieces of, of advice that stuck with me, but other than that, I learned to draw on my own. The first time I knew that I was decent at art was whenever I was, it's one of my earliest memories. I was drawing cartoons out of a newspaper at the age of like two. And it would have been something like if you're younger, um, you may not know that the cartoons existed back then, but in the newspaper that they'd, they'd have comic strips and uh, Peanuts, Charlie Brown was one of them. And I had drawn something, I don't know, Snoopy, Woodstock, something. And I showed my mom and she thought that I traced it. And I remember that even at age two, I was so mad that she had accused me of tracing that I drew it in front of her. And from that point on, we didn't have a lot when I was growing up, uh, but she always made sure that I had paper and pencils after that. And it became kind of what I was known for in school, which was drawing a ton. I Compared to what I do now, I sucked back in high school, but I was better than the other high schoolers at it. So it became my special thing that I was known for. And so I just continued to do it, and I've been doing it since like 1976. I'm taking the extra soft charcoal here and I'm going over some of these shadows in specific small places. I want to get to the darkest points of those shadows and lay in just a little bit of blackness to that. And then I'm going to blend that up into the lighter tones of black. So that again, there's another level of gradient there, but it's, you do not want to go overboard with this. You just want the darkest parts of the shadows to be um, like anti-highlighted here. Adding that extra little layer of black in the middle of those darkest shadows will make this hair uh, pop out and give it a lot more depth than what it had. Those, it, I only put in what, maybe five lines worth of those, but adding just those five lines of shadow there and blending those out made the hair more uh, textured and made it look deeper. Now I'm going to go back up into the part that I hate the most, which is uh, if you watched the first video, uh, you know that I complained about myself here because I tried to draw in this little stray clump of hairs. There's two of them, one here and just to the top of my middle finger. Uh, I tried to do that with negative space and it was really a mistake. I should have done it. I should have done the hair exactly the way ha I had it now, but without that negative space there, then I could have gone back in with a Tombow eraser and just erased those things in. It would have been so much faster. So I'm working on that. And then I noticed that the picture frame behind it, it, you probably can't see it because it's just barely outlined there, but there's a picture frame that hangs on that wall. And the very edge of that is almost pure white paper. And I didn't add that in whenever I did the background, uh, gray tone there, that little light gradient that happens. So I'm just taking a flat eraser and making one big swipe up. And just like that, the edge of the picture frame is now there. I will have to go back into that whenever I start working on that background and I'll add an edge to that that will give a very blurry, fat, fuzzy shadow along the edge of that and it will pop out like crazy. So speaking of the background, I looked at the face. In the first video, one of the things that I mentioned a couple different times is that there are three levels of tone here. The hair is the darkest, followed by the skin tones on the face, followed by the background gray along that wall. 
So looking at the face, I noticed that the background was way too light and I also wanted to have a much darker gradient on top than it was on the bottom. I'm actually modifying this from the original photo in order to add that sharper gradient there or that more dramatic gradient there. So while I'm making those comparisons from the hair to the face to that background wall, I might as well jump up and fix that because it's not much. I mean, it's only a couple inches worth of area and I might as well get that done now while the Q-tip's in my hand and while I'm thinking about it. Because again, once I have this done, that's it. That's all I have to do with that area. That's another section of the drawing that's totally finished and I can forget about it and give myself yet another finish line to cross. And now, just like that, more of this drawing is done. The motivation just keeps kickstarting because I look at it and say, oh, that part's done. I finished it. Let's move on to the next area and get that one finished so that we can complete this piece. I'm not too worried as I scrub down along the top of that hairline. I don't really want to get that too fuzzy. I don't want to blend that too much with a Q-tip because it'll make it look fuzzy and I'll have to resharpen it and all that. But I can scrub into that just a little bit because the fix for that isn't super bad. Some of the top of the hair is going to get kind of fuzzy because it the, the vision kind of bleeds through the hair to the background. So they kind of flow into each other. So I can scrub that background down into, barely into the top of her hairline. Then when I start adding in stray hairs and things like that, that's what will make it pop out against the background, if that makes sense. Now that I have that background laid in, I can start going along the top of the hair and start refining that a little bit and making those hairs stick out. What I would suggest, you notice I'm working on the top of the hair in an area where the background is not laid in yet. For anyone who's just starting out, I would suggest not doing that just yet because you're still going to have to do some scrubbing along the background that hasn't been laid in yet. And if you get too detailed with the hairs that come out along the top of her head, then when you're scrubbing in the background, you're also going to be scrubbing away and making... Uh, those little hairs that come off the top of her head look fuzzy. So I would suggest doing the background first, then laying those little hairs in on top of that. That said, I look at the background that I just laid. I darkened it up in an area that I'm happy with, but it also goes back to what I said before. When you fix one area uh, that you fixed by comparison, you will then need to go to another area and adjust that as well. So yes, I wanted the background to be a lot darker, but in turn, that also means that I need to make her skin tones much darker so that they go up in parallel to each other. I'd say that I'm going up in value probably 20 to 40 percent here on the face and the difference that it's going to make is dramatic. Whenever I get down to these cheeks and I, I get these temple shadows put in and the forehead shadows put in and I start to get that really blended together, these highlights jump out and the curves on her face become super realistic. I, I love the way this turns out when you get these shadows just right and you get the blending just right on them.
Now I, I tone that down a bit because there is one highlight that goes along that area that was hard to see to begin with. So I lightened up what I just darkened so that the shape of that highlight is correct. Then I can go back over those eraser marks uh, with the, the Q-tip and blend those the way I want to. Now look at the way that highlight along the top of her cheek is a lot more dramatic than what it was. There's a definite difference between that highlight and that shadow. Now, well, I think we end up going back a few more times and darkening those areas as well. So we may actually go back over that highlight and soften that up a little bit with a little bit of light gray. But I love the way just a tiny little change in the, the values of those shadows and those skin tones can really make a highlight pop out. So now you can see that if you look in the middle, well, let's look at her cheek, the, the easiest to see reflection. That highlight starts at her cheek and it goes up and to the left at a curve and then continues through her hair right through the middle. So if you look at this as an overall piece, that one reflection stretches from the back of her head to the tip of her cheek and then continues on the tip of her nose. So it's in the right area. It's got that cool looking wavy look and it brings those areas together. It, it tells the viewer this face and this hair and this nose are in the same light reacting the same way. Now when I add the giant handlebar mustache to her here in just a bit, I'm just I'm, I'm kidding, I'm not gonna add a giant handlebar mustache to the girl. Now this is what I was talking about in the first video whenever, when I said that we're going to start refining and blending the skin tones and shadows into the highlights. You can still tell that they're there, but that gradient that I created at first, the one that we used to create landmarks, we're, we're getting rid of those landmarks now. We're starting to smooth this out and turn it into re a refined, touched up drawing into one like big cohesive unit now. The landmarks are no longer needed so we can start blending and creating that subtlety that we talked about earlier. I love it whenever I'm doing a drawing and I tell myself we're laying in the foundation and then we'll refine it later. When we get to that refining and we get to that point that I've marked later, that feels so cool. It feels so good. Whether I knew it or not at the time, whenever I set the goal of let's do this later, that later becomes a finish line. And once we start you know, working on those things that we set aside earlier, crossing that finish line helps boost that motivation again. It, it feels like an accomplishment. And that's, that's the big thing with tedious drawings like this that take a lot of time. Keeping yourself motivated to finish is one of the hardest things to do whenever you're just starting out as an artist. You wanna have it done now so you can move on to the next thing. And rather than whipping out a whole bunch of drawings that take an hour to do, my personal thing, the thing I like doing the most, is spending a lot of time on one drawing and making it as good as I can possibly make it, and then move on to the next one when I'm totally happy with that first drawing. 
So now we can just kind of start bouncing around um, in this neck area. And we're not just darkening up the whole area here. Some of my strokes are concentrated so that the shadows appear to be the shadows of the curls that are above them. So it's not just one solid shadow. It's a shadow that breaks up and becomes darker in some areas and lighter in others to give the appearance that each of these curls is casting its own shadow. Now we look at the rest of the drawing like we've talked about before many times before. We look at the areas that we're doing compared to the areas that we've already done and make adjustments. So I've noticed that some of these shadows around the ear and the ear itself is a little too light. So I'm going back with a little darker charcoal on that Q-tip and I'm going to start touching up areas especially around the top of the top right of her ear where that hair comes together in more of like a fuzzy nature and it's not quite a shadow and not quite hair it's a kind of a mixture of both just darkening that up a little bit with a q-tip makes that stand out a bit more then i can go back into the ears because now i've got a direct comparison from the ear to that you know triangular shadow that we just made and it makes the ear look a little too light so while we're there we're going to go back in shape some of these shadows tighten up some of the ridges, darken up some of the skin tones that are on the ear, and that way the highlights that are on the ear, on those little sharp apexes around those folds, those will stick out way better. And we can take a blending stump and go back into these areas that have not just darker shadows, but thinner, more defined shadows and very lightly scrub those in, especially along the, the bottom fold of the ear. Because that's a pretty, like if you look at ears and you look at the internal folds that happen, and a lot of them, they're, the folds happen so dramatically that they'll cast harsher shadows. And you don't want to outline those with a pencil because then it will look two-dimensional and it, it will look like it's kind of carved into, you know, chiseled into stone. But using a blending stump to do it makes those shadows and those lines a little fatter and a little fuzzier around the edges and they look more like shadows than lines. That's what makes the ear look natural and realistic. It looks soft. Now we can grab a hard charcoal pencil and I can pull down singular uh, little strands of hair over the top of the ear, but I don't want those pencil marks to be super sharp. So I pull those down across the top of the ear, then I take a blending stump and I smooth those out a little bit by lightly going over each of those strokes. Now compare and contrast again, and we notice that there are a few tiny little shadows that need to be darkened up a little bit. So I do that with a heavily loaded uh, blending stump, and then for the ones that need to go even darker than that, which it's not much, just tiny, tiny little areas. I can go back with that dark charcoal and lay those in with dark charcoal with a light touch. And then I can go back with a blending stump and smooth out the pencil marks yet again. Look how the ear pops out a lot more now that I've added that extra layer of uh, dark, dark gray or almost totally black. Especially whenever I start blending that with a stump, now it's Give, given it a softer look, but you can tell there's a definite sharp shadow there where the ear folds over on itself. I'm taking a brand new Q-tip and I'm pressing on the end and kind of spinning it, 
and then I kind of wiggle it around because one of the things I'm doing by doing that is loosening up the cotton that's on the end of it with no charcoal on it at all we're using a totally clean q-tip I'm gonna start lightly scrubbing the skin across her entire face and what that's gonna do is take some of the charcoal that's on the face already and uh, very delicately blend that out into the areas that have less charcoal and so you can see by doing that it softened up those highlights a bit so they're not quite as harsh and we're also adding a very very thin coat of gray over the top of that white reflection now what it's also doing it's picking up more charcoal from what we already have laid on there so we're slightly dirtying up that q-tip as we scrub I can use that to my advantage by going back into those dark areas and blending those as well and it's going to add just a tiny bit more darkness than what there was before the biggest key here though is it's not really about lightening and darkening it's more about blending to make it all smooth and flow together we don't want to lose those highlights which we would if we used a dirty q-tip but we want to blend them out so that the fade is more gradual and more subtle Now I'm just going to go back into the lips with a Tombow eraser and very delicately and very lightly I'm going to add in a couple of just little pinstripe reflections here and there to kind of break up uh, well you, if you watch the first video you know that we laid that in with a q-tip and a little bit with a blending stump but it was the color on that lip was too solid it was too much of a, a one big blob of gray what we want to do instead is take away some of that so that the lips have multiple layers of reflection and highlights that way it looks like um, the the moisture that happens on lips normally then we can go back in with the blending stump and start darkening up the edges of the lips so now it looks deeper like you can see the top lip and then you can barely see into the opening of her mouth on that that far lip that happens we're just darkening up the ridges of that to create a shadow and separate those two lips so you can tell that we're looking into her mouth but just slightly it's it's barely noticeable Now by comparing and contrasting we know that the eyebrows could use a little bit of darkening. By doing that notice how the eyebrow is dark on the left and the right but right in the middle where there's a highlight on her eyelid that highlight goes up into her forehead the eyebrow also highlights in that area. So the hairs there along that highlight are slightly lighter than the rest of her eyebrow and it gives the illusion that light is also hitting there. Now's where I'm going to start really studying the details on the uh, reference photo and making sure that all my lines and shadows in the eyes are dead on because we're so close to being completely done with this face outside of, you know, end of the drawing touch ups. I just want to make sure that all those shadows are in the right place. I think that's a good stopping point for this. We can call this section of the drawing done for right now.
Um, it's as close to being done as we can get it without going into straight out, you know, touch ups and things like that. Tomorrow, we'll jump back into this or uh, within the next couple of days. These videos take a ton of time to edit and put together and do the audio. Uh, but the next one will be heading into the background and doing a little bit of the fuzzy arms and stuff that happened behind that. There's a large picture that's behind the two women. And we're going to go into showing you how to do fuzzy, out-of-focus backgrounds, which I think are really fun. They don't take much time to do, and the technique is super simple. But hang in there. Uh, we will see you on the very next video. Thank you so much for watching.